everyone and welcome to Straight Talk by Wine Spectator. My name is Marianne Warbick. I'm the senior editor and senior tasting coordinator for Wine Spectator. I'm based in the Napa office and like I say, I'm really excited to be here. Today I'm also honored to be here to introduce you to Barbara Benke and uh, wait till you hear about all the many things that she's accomplished. Uh, wine Spectator is, of course, the world's most widely read wine publication. We have three and a half million readers, as I like to say. I certainly hope that you're one of them. It's never too late to start. Uh, please feel free to check out winespectator.com, our website. There's always a lot of information and news there. There was an exclusive news story, actually, that we had yesterday um, where the famed Lewis Sellers, based in Napa, has been purchased by... Uh, the uh, Justin um, based in Pasadena and so that was a big news. Um, there's always um, pictures of dogs these days and uh, plenty of other things. There's also a tasting highlight uh, with California Sauvignon Blancs under $20 that I wrote. So how about that? Um, Barbara will be uh, connecting with us here. I think I hit the button. Let me try one more time. And um, uh, as I mentioned, so uh, Paso Robles is Justin Vineyards and Winery bought Napa's Lewis Cellars. So um, we're going to try that one more time. I saw that you, you declined my request. Let's try again, if we may. I'm going to try one more time to connect with Barbara. Um, also on our website, there's this news story. Oh, thank you for saying someone says they love the dog stories. It's good to hear. We put a lot of work into that and we all have our favorites. Um, but there was some news in wine and health about going with, um, right. hi there, Barbara. <laughs> hi. <laughs> hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for saying that. Um, I, uh, I know I'm not alone in saying that Jackson family wines and in particular Kendall Jackson was a really important part of my personal wine journey. I've never told you the story about my very first time I ever ordered a glass of wine in a restaurant. I was 22 years old living in Columbus, Ohio. I was on a date at a Spanish restaurant and I ordered a glass of Kendall Jackson Chardonnay. And I can't remember if the server recommended it to me or complimented me on my choice, but I just felt like I totally nailed it. Like the wine was delicious. I felt so posh and sophisticated. And it was just such an important, you know, part of crossing that threshold and be into becoming a certified wine lover. So I thank you and your family for many great wines over the years. Um, before we get started with the questions, Barbara, I just want to make sure to do a proper introduction to some of your many accomplishments, besides helping me fall in love with wine. Um, you're an innovative innovator and leader. You co-founded Jackson Family Wines with your late husband, Jess Jackson. You have uh, this beautiful por portfolio of wine estates from all over the world, including Chile, France, South Africa, and Italy, among others. I'm not going to mention every names, but I do want to just introduce our readers to um, all of the California brands because I'm pretty sure they've drunk a lot of really great wine, not realizing it's part of the Jackson Family Wines portfolio. So in California alone, Kendall Jackson, Cambria, Cardinal La Coya, Copan, Mount Brave, La Crema, Murphy Good, Siduri, Hartford Family, Matanzas Creek, Brewer, Clifton, and Byron. That's very, very impressive. Um, you took over the helm of chair and proprietor in 2011. If you fast forward to 2017, we gave you the Distinguished Service Award celebrating your philanthropy. That was also the year that you appeared on our cover. Um, and I know that you have a lot of um, uh, philanthropic uh, adventures out there. I, I just want to mention you have been chair of the Sonoma County Wine Auction and a global ambassador for the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Foundation. Uh, again, welcome to you, Barbara. Um, I want to start by um, talking about your entry into wine. You didn't start off in wine. You started off in law. You were a graduate of the University of California's Hastings College of Law, and you practiced constitutional law and in particular land use cases. You even argued in front of the Supreme Court. So Barbara, tell me what it was like to transition from law into wine. It was the greatest. Um, I was a litigator for 13 years, two months, uh, one week, two hours and 20 minutes. No, but who's counting? <laughs> no, um, it was uh, law was really fun for about 10% of the time. The rest of the time was uh, somewhat tedious. 
And when I transitioned to wine, it, people liked me again, which was really nice. And it was such a fun business. So it was something that uh, was really, uh, wine was a blast after being a litigator. <laughs> Well, I'd like to talk about the family in Jackson Family Wines. You know, I just described, you know, a very big wine empire, but I think it gets lost on people that I, I had um, about a dozen family members work for the company. And of course, you're at the at the head of it. Can you tell me what it's like to work with a family that shares the same vision, even if they're coming at it from a few different angles? It's it's uh, really good, and my kids grew up with wine, and so, um, as a matter of fact, I shouldn't say this, but uh, Christopher, I think one of his first phrases when he was a baby was, mmm, Chardonnay. So <laughs> he, uh, he actually would cruise down to the cellar at Stone Street on his bicycle when he was 12 to uh, work during the summer, and he learned a lot. Uh, Katie and Julia, I'll uh, worked in wineries as well, and uh, they learned how to make wine. I think Chris and uh, Haley, my step granddaughter, in their fourth grade class, their school project was making making Zinfandel uh, with uh, Don Hartford leading the charge. So it's a family business. Everyone's grown up in it, and they all know a lot about it. And so. Um, they advise me. I'm sure they uh, they respect uh, my opinion, but they're getting to the point where they definitely have opinions of their own, and um, they're help leading the charge in so many ways uh, into the future. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those later. But you mentioned your daughters in particular, um, and in the and we're going to talk about your the rooted for good announcement later. But um, just to to give some context, one of the uh, pieces of information that came out in this um, conference that you recently had that really stuck with me was that if you look at winemakers across California, it's estimated that women only make up about ten to fifteen percent. But within Jackson Family Wines, that number is sixty one percent, and I know that. Um, about 50% of leadership and sales is also made up of women. Can you speak a little bit to me about how you've seen the role of women evolve in the wine industry? Sure. Uh, when I first started out in wine, uh, one of our first winemakers, Signa Zoller, um, then Signa Bengard, she was our winemaker for Cambria when we first started it in 1986. So uh, I knew a lot of women winemakers at the time. Zelma Long, um, you know, it was one uh, stellar example. Signa, um, various other women, uh, Eugenia Keegan, um, that were very active in the business. And as we went forward, we seemed to have more and more um, winemakers that uh, uh, were... Um, really uh, coming to the forefront and women have great palates, men do too, but there's a lot of uh, really highly skilled women in the business, especially in production. Um, our uh, second viticulturalist up in Oregon is a woman and we're seeing more women viticulturalists throughout the company. Um, a lot of women in production leading the charge in the labs. Uh, we have one really bright, bright science uh, person that is doing a lot of research into smoke and wine. And um, anyway, there are a lot of women in production. And sales came along a little bit later, but I'd say that many of our best salespeople are women. Um, so it's, it's changed over the years. It's, uh, it's really... Um, have, there are a lot more opportunities, I think, now than there ever were. But uh, there always were opportunities. It's just so widespread now that it's um, something that we, we're proud of. I completely agree. And I think one of the most important pieces of that is visibility and people being able to um, have someone to look up to. And I think that you becoming um, leader of your family company in 2011 and really putting yourself out there 
was a really important thing for a lot of people, you know, myself included. It's, it's very inspiring to see. So we thank you for that. I want to completely switch gears and talk about horses. So in addition to making a lot of terrific wine, you also lead one of the world's most prestigious thoroughbred horse racing and breeding operations based in Louisville, Kentucky called Stone Street Farms. And you've made, uh, produced a Horses of the Year. Kendall Jackson is, of course, the preferred wine of the Kentucky Derby. Um, how did your passion for horses come about? Well, it, uh, it started off slowly, let's put it that way. Um, Jess, uh, in 2003, he was well known as a micromanager and he was sort of driving us all crazy. And I said, why don't you get a hobby? So he went and bought a racehorse. Actually, he bought half of a racehorse in partnership. Then he decided that he liked it. And so he um, went on to buy some more. And in about 2007, we bought part of the horse Curlin, who had just won his maiden race. That's his first race by 15 lengths. And Curlin was so excited exciting to watch that uh, I got into it too at that point. So from that point on, I was hooked. Um, Curlin was horse of the year twice. Uh, and then Rachel Alexandra, a wonderful filly, uh, won horse of the year in 2009, beat the, uh, the male horses in the Preakness, the Woodward Stakes. And then um, we've gone on from there. And now I'm addicted, I'm afraid. So it's a uh, it's a really fun business. I, I can't say it's more fun than wine. Uh, it depends on, on what you're doing. If you're winning a grade one race, it's uh, really, really fun. Well, I know you're an animal lover. In fact, um, Riley, Imogene, and Penny, three of your labs, um, appeared in our, our uh, story about dogs of wine country earlier this year. When you go to the stables, do they feel like pets? I mean, do you snuggle with them or do they feel like employees? <laughs> So the fillies are really um, snuggly. And of course, the little baby horses are, are the cutest things ever. So um, yeah, to some extent, they're, they're like pets. Um, and then of course, we do sell yearlings. So that's, uh, that's the main source of revenue for the farm. And that's coming up uh, shortly. And we're the leading seller of yearlings in Kentucky, have been for a couple of years. So at that point, you've got to let them go. That's, that's a little tough. Um, my kids always say that uh, the one word I don't really like to, you know, I love to buy, but uh, sell is a difficult word for me. But uh, for example, we sold uh, the filly that later went on to win the Kentucky Oaks this past year. And uh, so we do sell some really good, good babies as well. Well, you gave me the perfect um, transition to my next question when you say one thing that you like to say is buy um, as opposed to sell. Um, because I think one of the um, most impressive things under your leadership is how much Jackson Family Wines has grown to new heights, including new parts of the wine world. And you've really strategically expanded your portfolio. I imagine that your interest in uh, land use and property acquisitions as an attorney um, might be part of that. But just in particular, in the last few years, you've expanded in Oregon with Willa Kenzie, Penner Ash, and Grand Moraine. In Australia, um, my heart is there because I cover those wines, um, Yangara, Hickenbotham, and most recently, Giant Steps. Can you explain what made you want to invest in particular in, in Oregon and Australia and how you saw that as part of your family's portfolio? Yes. Uh, well, there was a big portfolio of vineyards that had been owned by the California Teachers um, Retirement Fund, uh, CalPERS. And uh, CalPERS was selling those vineyards. So we went and toured all of them. And the ones in California were nice, but um, somewhat duplicative of things that we already had. But the ones in Oregon were stellar. I mean, they were absolutely the best things um, in their portfolio, I thought. And I had always uh, been of the opinion that the weather in Oregon was a little bit iffy because of rain and, and whatever, but I don't know if it's climate change or, or, or what, but since we've been there, we have not really, I, I shouldn't say this, uh, knock on wood, yeah. we have not had a bad harvest in Oregon um, uh, since we've been there. So 
it's an area where you can produce wonderful Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. The vineyards that we purchased were, were uh, among the best in Oregon. And so we started two wineries, uh, Grand Moraine and Zena Crown, and then purchased Willa Kenzie and purchased Penner Ash. And they're all small uh, boutique wineries, um, estate uh, focused and different winemakers with different uh, points of view. So we love all those wines. I love going to Oregon and the wines are just going to uh, grow, I think, in, uh, in importance throughout the country uh, as we go forward. So that's been a great project. Everyone, uh, everyone really loves being a part of it. And then how did you end up in Australia? Well, uh, 20 years ago, I think it was, we uh, started a wine brand, Yangara, and hired Peter Fraser, who was a wonderful winemaker down there. And when we started out, we were just buying grapes from different regions, and um, Peter was blending them. And then we bought a uh, vineyard in the Claren Vale, which um, became the foundation for Yangara, and it contains a lot of plantings of old bushvine Grenache, which are spectacular. Um, they're uh, biodynamic, organic, uh, one ton an acre, antique bush vines, but they produce uh, wines that are really stellar. So that was the foundation for Yangara, and um, Yangara became so successful in in Australia that I asked Peter if we could find something to um, expand into in McLaren Vale. So he said, maybe we can land bank. So he called me up and he said, well, we, we can't find anything really just to land bank, but I found one of the best vineyards in Australia in McLaren Vale called Hickenbotham, and we can buy that. So we did. And Hickenbotham also contains some Bordeaux varieties. So uh, Chris Carpenter, who's our winemaker for La Coya and uh, Cardinal, uh, decided that he would like to help with those wines. So he goes down there um, to uh, make the Bordeaux elements of the wines. And then Peter is uh, managing the rest of it. So that's another one that um, we started, but it's really, really been a great, uh, great uh, labor of love. And then Giant Steps, we just love the wines. So we, we saw the vineyards, we loved the wines. Um, it, was, uh, it was known, made known to us that we could purchase the winery. And so we did. And uh, it's, it's just one of these wineries that does everything, um, everything well. And um, I don't, we're not really going to expand it in volume, but uh, we're probably going to um, be breaking ground, assuming COVID cooperates, on a new winery there on the Sexton Vineyard uh, in the next year or so. So mm -hmm. that's another one that we hope to make one of the great icons of uh, Australia. Absolutely. Well, I want to switch gears again and talk about Rooted for Good, which is what the entire wine industry is talking about. Um, recently, your company announced a set of goals um, about uh, um, environmentalism in particular. There's a lot of really ambitious goals um, and including a 10-year sustainability and climate action plan. I think the biggest one is um, the intention to cut your carbon footprint in half by 2030 and become climate positive by 2050. Um, but there's also social responsibility, diversity, equity, um, and inclusion uh, goals. Uh, you're transitioning all of your estate vineyards to regenerative farming practices. And you've also talked a lot about water management. I know you've already reduced your water intensity um, 60% since 2008. Uh, can you tell me about, uh, you know, what, what was the urgency behind making such a, a, a big, broad statement so publicly? Well, in, we're in California. So in California, there's such a need to reduce water usage and to protect your sources of water, to enhance the watersheds, to um, uh, get uh, more restorative practices so that we can maintain a water table and 
the ability to farm into the future. So it's a long-term strategy because we're a long-term company and we're a family company. It's very important to my kids, uh, grandkids, that we continue on this path. So we're looking at best practices, how we can um, do more uh, in um, before he passed away, Jess uh, got together with Roger Bolton up at UC Davis. We started the, uh, the uh, Jess Jackson um, study program up there for um, sustainable practices. So we've been in partnership with Davis to see if we can enhance our environmental uh, practices for many, many years. And this is something that Katie uh, Jackson, my daughter, uh, it's very important to her. She manages a lot of the sustainability um, practices. And Julia, of course, is very involved. She has her own uh, nonprofit called Grounded. She's studying ways to um, enhance the environment. And the other, the other family members are all really into it too. So. We're, we're forging ahead, they're leading the charge, and I think that we can um, make uh, strong advances, and I, I think our goals are lofty, they're really ambitious, but um, we're, um, we're gonna make it. So we're uh, just gonna continue, continue on that path. Um, I, I find the regenerative agriculture elements of it very, very uh, intriguing. Uh, we've uh, uh, enlarged our organic footprint. We're incorporating livestock to weed some of the vineyards. We're doing some kind of uh, groundwater recharge projects. We've got a lot of study projects in partnership with uh, various entities, both uh, public and um, you know, the university. So I think we're studying how we can make a better make a better world um, through uh, what we're doing in the vineyard. So we're hoping to do some carbon recapture actually in our vineyard from some of our um, viticultural practices as well. So stay That's tuned. Amazing. Um, it's, it's a work in progress and uh, the kids really are leading the charge on that one. So um, yeah, uh, absolutely. But, but environmental okay. health, Sorry to interrupt, but environmentalism has always been a part of your company's ethos. It just feels like now you're being um, more public about it and a leader and really trying to share best practice ideas with other people in the industry. Um, you mentioned the Jess uh, Jackson Sustainable Winery Building at UC Davis, which I've been to. It, it, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. It's, it's a hub for sustainable winemaking and experiment experimentation and research. But I also want to mention in 2019, you co-founded the International Wineries for Climate Action, which we thankfully call IWCA, with the Torres family in Spain to address the climate change and drive uh, collective action uh, towards uh, decarbonizing the wine industry. So um, can you just tell us a little bit about IWCA um, and how it's, it's a part of the, the Rooted for Good? Yes, uh, IWCA came about uh, when the Torres uh, family and our family got together and decided that we could uh, share some of our practices and hope to get other wineries to share their best practices and see if we can move forward on a global level. So now I think we're up to 10 wineries and um, I think Kay's going to announce a couple more that have joined, maybe uh, several more that have joined. So that's something, uh, they have conferences. Now, of course, they're on Zoom, unfortunately, but um, uh, we'll get back to, to meeting and, and see if we can uh, move forward and come up with a plan to help all of us achieve the next, next levels. Well, we certainly appreciate you being a leader in that aspect and really, and really you know, publicly putting yourselves out there and talk about what can be achieved with a lot of hard work. Um, Kind of speaking of looking towards the future, um, Barbara, I'd love to hear <clears throat> your thoughts on the long-term viability and health of the wine industry. So when you look into the crystal ball, what do you see in the future of wine? I think that uh, wine is going to be healthy. It's going to be something that uh, will be part of our lives. 
in the future. I, I'm convinced that if we can uh, bring wine to younger people without, you know, just doing what we're doing. In other words, we're making, making great wines, but exposing people to the great wines that, uh, that we're making and throughout the wine industry in California and, and Oregon and elsewhere, that uh, we'll get new consumers and uh, consumers that will stick with us for, for long periods of time. So I think especially uh, having three 30-some um, year old children, it's very important to them where their food comes from and where their wine comes from and how it's made and, and how it's grown. So I think what we're doing in that respect is uh, something that will uh, prove valuable to us in the long run to, uh, to reach these new consumers. And then in terms of climate, um, a lot of the practices that we're we're putting into play, I think will enable us to be stable in the long run. Um, and certainly uh, in California, you know, with stress on, on water and conservation, um, that's gonna be important to us going forward. So I think the future is pretty bright and um, we're certainly investing a lot of our resources uh, in going forward into the future. So. We think it's bright. We're willing to um, forge onward in, in the wine business. So that's, uh, that's what we do. When we talked about this earlier, you told me, I mean, we were talking about how wine has just become part of our culture in this country. And you pointed out that people drink wine in good times and in bad times. So um, we should all be pretty secure with our jobs looking <laughs> forward. Well, I'm yeah. so sorry to say our time is up. Um, my huge thanks to you, Barbara. Before we go, I, I just have to um, mention that if you enjoy our Straight Talk series on Instagram, uh, this is a, a weekly thing. Next week, my colleague Tim Fish will be talking to, to Ket Bramlett from Vidon Vineyard in Oregon. Um, I had the chance to interview her earlier this year. She was absolutely delightful and will make you thirsty for Oregon wines. And then uh, not only do we have the, um, the um, Straight Talks coming up, but there is also um, an archive of all the Straight Talks we've been doing for the last couple of years. So feel free to look at our Instagram page. And I'm really sorry my cat Harriet decided to join our talk, but um, she, I think she really likes your voice, Barbara. And I think she really likes her own voice. But um, thank you again to Barbara Benke of Jackson Family Wines. We are, I'm just so thrilled to be able to have people learn more about what you and your family are doing. And thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, thanks, Marianne. It's been, um, it's been fun talking to you. And uh, yeah, I hear the kitty, so. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You have a cat, though, too, right? I do. I do. I does, have the most does, spoiled cat in the world. So, yeah. Well, does your, does your cat like to, to join on Zooms as well? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I Starting don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, they took over the internet, so I guess it makes sense. But anyway, thank you again to you, Barbara, and thank you to Jackson Family Wines. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye.